Rue Burrow got his start as an honest man, a simple cowboy and farmer with a wife and children. But when his wife died and the farm went belly up, Rube took to earning a living any way he could. And that way led him to become one of the most notorious and most wanted train robbers of the Old West. Who was Rube Burrow? A good man pushed too far, the Robin Hood of Alabama who only stole from the rich? Or just another good old boy lured by the trappings of easy money? Stick around and find out. My name's Josh and you're listening to the Wild West Extravaganza. Reuben Houston Burrow, Rube for short, was born in Lamar County, Alabama on December 11th, 1855. One of ten children, Reuben enjoyed what seemed to be a relatively normal childhood for the time and place, or at least as normal a childhood as one could have when your mother is a practicing witch. Yeah, a witch, as in flying brooms and cauldrons and the eyes of Newt. At least that's what the locals thought. Dame Burrow, as Rube's mother was often called, was known as both a witch and a faith healer who was rumored to have cured all sorts of ailments, everything from warts to tumors and even cancer. Rubin's father, Alan, was a farmer by trade but also spent time as a teacher, even teaching several of his own children, which is always awkward for the kids. Alan would leave home for a spell during the war between the states, serving with the 5th Alabama Cavalry, but it doesn't look like he was gone all that long. Upon returning home, it's rumored that the elder Burrow supplemented his meager farmer's income by doing a little illegal distilling and whiskey running. However, this doesn't necessarily mean he raised his son to be an outlaw. Matter of fact, story goes that when a 15-year-old Rube was caught stealing, his father made him return all the ill-gotten booty. Speaking of Rube, he was described as an athletic kid, active, spirited, an avid woodsman and hunter. Like many teenage boys who grew up on a farm, he far preferred to roam the forest rather than work the plow. And I certainly don't blame him there. In the fall of 1872, somewhere around the age of 18, Rube was itching to see the world, so he headed west to Erath County, Texas, where his Uncle Joel had a farm. And I know what you're thinking, Erath County, Texas, big deal. But listen, Rube was from Alabama. Anything was an upgrade. Now, to be completely honest, I don't know a whole lot about this period of Rube's life other than the fact that he was just a hard-working young man, engaging in both farming and punching cattle. This was 1870s Texas, though, also known as Wild West Central. And one theme I've noticed when it comes to a lot of your Old West outlaws is that they didn't exactly like to work. Not that they couldn't work, don't get me wrong, many an outlaw got to start as a top hand or garnered reputations as being good in the saddle. But they also enjoyed the finer things in life, such as gambling and liquor and soft beds and friendly whores. Fun times and easy money. And they were generally engaged in outlaw activity, obtaining this easy money fairly early in life. Not so with Reuben H. Burrow. In fact, throughout his early 20s, Rube was simply an average, productive member of society. By all accounts, he was an upstanding citizen, a hard worker. Hell, he even bought his own little plot of land, got married, started making babies and he joined the Masonic Lodge in Stevensville. All in all, things were looking pretty damn good for young Reuben. By the year 1880, a 25-ish year old Reuben and wife Virginia were living in Wise County, Texas, just northwest of Fort Worth, and already have two children, a three-year-old William and a one-year-old Alden. Reuben's younger brother Jim had also arrived from Alabama as well. Just one big happy family living that American dream. At least they were until 1881 when tragedy struck. Reuben's wife, Virginia, would sadly be taken by the yellow fever. Now, for those of you not familiar, the yellow fever is a disease that causes the afflicted, usually men, to have a clear and overwhelming preference for women of Asian descent. Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, Cambodian, nationalities of preference vary from patient to patient, but this almost unbearable lust always leads to more serious symptoms, such as anime or manga consumption, the collecting of samurai swords, making a fool of oneself by attempting to learn Mandarin, listening to K-pop, creeping out each and every Asian female who's unlucky enough to get within 100 yards of your creepy gaze. The list goes on. Uh, no. Actually, uh, yellow fever is, in fact, a viral disease often spread by mosquitoes, which explains its prevalence in Texas, that causes fever, nausea, muscle pain, headaches, and in some cases, liver failure and death. It seems to be largely eradicated here in the United States, but as recently as 2013, it caused the death of 45,000 people, most of whom were in Africa. If you ever get a chance to visit Huntsville, Texas, stop on by the Oakwood Cemetery and walk around. In addition to paying respects to the grave of Sam Houston, you'll also see many a marker with a year of death listed as 1867. 
And I mean a lot of markers with that year. You can't miss it. That was due to a full-blown yellow fever pandemic that raged throughout the state, killing thousands. And I reckon every few years it would just pop back up again, like in 1881 when the fever took Rube's wife Virginia and possibly one of their children. I am a little unclear as to how many children Rube and Virginia had at the time of her death. Uh, there's a Mary Florence Burrow that's listed on numerous sources as the daughter of Rube and Burrow, and she was born in 1881. So she was still a baby. And Rube's son, William, who is on the 1880 census, would live all the way to 1945. However, I could find no more information on the Alden Burrow, who I mentioned a minute ago and who was listed as being one years old on that same census. Either way, whether Rube lost just his wife or a child as well, got to assume it would have been a real punch to the gut. Can't imagine how he must have felt. His surviving son, William, would have been three, four years old at the time and daughter Mary just an infant. I mean, what do you do in such a situation? Here he was, just 26 years old, with two young kids to care for. One of them still sucking at the tit. I mean, I guess he could have hired somebody to take care of him while he continued to work the fields and punch cattle, but hell, who could afford that? So Rube did what I think was the only thing he could do. He loaded both kids up in a small wagon, also known as a buckboard, rode north, crossing the Red River into Indian Territory, and he left both children there, alone, on the prairie. Uh, he left them with about a week's worth of food per kid, a couple of blankets, full canteens, wished them luck, and returned home. Years later, when Rube would write his memoirs, he would say, quote, It was in my mind that the children would probably be taken in by a she-wolf or perhaps a buffalo heifer who had lost her calves. In hindsight, I now see that this notion was hastily ill-conceived and what doctors are now describing as mentally retarded. And furthermore, it would have been better if I just took them to an orphanage or just drop them off at a church, or literally anywhere, anything but abandon them to die a slow death of exposure on the barren wastelands of Oklahoma. But hey, YOLO, am I right? End quote. Uh, once back on the homestead, Reuben then busied himself doing what he did best. Hard work. And yeah, I did make that last little part up uh, about him abandoning his children. Truth is, Rube took the kids back to Alabama, where he left them with his parents. At least for the time being. And I do kind of think this probably was his best option. He wasn't abandoning his children, and I'm sure he had plans to establish himself, hopefully make a little bit of money, find a good woman to marry, and then send for the kids. And, you know, hopefully in the meantime, they learned some cool incantations or spells from their mamma. As for Rube, he did go back to Texas, and he did just keep on busting his ass. Farming, running cattle. Dude garnered a reputation as one hell of a horseman, in addition to being good with a gun. At least as far as targets were concerned even began entering and winning shooting contests. Now, as far as the cowboy and win, I wasn't able to find out if Rube participated in any cattle drives during this time or he just worked locally. Uh, there is some hinting that Rube possibly altered a few brands during this period or herded up unbranded cattle and claimed them for his own. But so did a lot of other people. There wouldn't be enough rope in Texas to hang everybody who altered a brand back in them days. Other than that, though, it was business as usual. Now, here's where things get a little bit confusing. Rube would marry a second time to a Miss Adeline Hoover of Erath County. The general narrative I've found is that following this marriage, Rubin's crops failed, the farm went belly up, and finally his wife left him. A perfect storm that caused him to finally resort to a life of crime. This would have been in the mid-1880s. Rube was in his 30s and spent his life mostly doing what he was supposed to do, right? Always working hard, always with the dreams of owning his own land, raising a family. But when life wouldn't cooperate, you know, his first wife dying, now this, when doing the right thing just couldn't make ends meet, he decided to make things work one way or the other. The general consensus, I guess, is that Rube had reached his breaking point and had no other recourse but to choose the life of an outlaw. Never robbing the poor, though. Oh, no, no, no. Always just taking that money from the mean old rich people. Truth is, though, Rubin began his descent into lawlessness before his second marriage. For whatever reason, most sources claim that he married his second wife, Adeline, in 1884. However, I found the marriage record, and unless I'm missing something here, the pair actually tied the knot on December 30th, 1886. I guess it doesn't really matter, as this marriage would be short-lived, regardless, and just a blip on his radar. The word is that Rube's new wife didn't care much for having a criminal for a husband, so she split. Here's what we do know. On the 1st of December, 1886, just a few weeks before his second marriage, Rube Burrow would rob his first train. He, along with his little brother Jim, a guy named Nat or Nep Thornton, 
and Henderson Bromley successfully held up the Fort Worth and Denver train in Bellevue, Texas on their way back home from Indian Territory. And this wasn't some dramatic action where they raced their horses next to the train and jumped onto it or put dynamite on the rails or whatever else you may see in the movies. Nothing like that. They simply waited at the depot, and when the train stopped, they came aboard, guns drawn. Instead of taking a risk at robbing what they thought might be a heavily guarded mail car, they instead turned to the passengers, taking their cash and valuables and getting away with... Not much. Anywhere between one to three hundred bucks and a handful of pocket watches. Not exactly the James gang, right? The next holdup would prove to be much more profitable, however. Rube and the boys held up a passenger train in Palo Pinto County, Texas, on January 23rd, and after firing off a few rounds and threatening the rail employees, the gang made off with a cool two grand, or around 59000 in today's money. Not a bad little payday. Also, notice in both of these holdups, they're robbing the passengers, normal people. I do find it unlikely that they took the time to figure out the yearly income of these innocent citizens before robbing them. The idea that they only stole from the rich is a common one when it comes to your folk hero type outlaws like Rube Burrow, and I'm not really sure how true it is. I mentioned the James gang a minute ago. The same was said about them, right? That they'd shake hands with their prospective victims, and if someone had a heavily calloused palm indicating they were poor farmers, the boys would just refuse their money. But like I said, I'm not sure if there's any truth to all that. In Rube's defense, he would oftentimes target the express cars as well, as you'll soon see, taking only money that was hurting the railroad's pockets. Following this second robbery, the gang split up, and Rube and Brother Jim returned to Erath County, where they bought a plot of land in cash, as well as a small herd of cattle. And for about six months or so, they resumed their lives of hard-working men. But that easy money was calling, and in June 1887, Rube heeded that call. By the way, by this point, the gang had added a new recruit by the name of William Brock, who will play a major role in Burroughs' future. All right, back to the story. For Rube's next robbery, he and the boys got a little creative. They boarded a train headed east out of Tarrant County, Texas, just outside the town of Benbrook. Waited till the train was crossing a trestle and then ordered the conductor to stop. A trestle, I actually had to look this up myself because I, I kind of thought I knew what it was, but a trestle is sort of like a suspended train bridge. The idea was that with the train stopped up high on that trestle, the passengers couldn't just hop out and make a run for it without taking a long dive into the river below. And it worked. Worked so well that they pulled the same damn stunt on the same damn trestle just three months later. In both of these holdups, they were said to have gotten around 3000 But you know, just always take that amount of money with a grain of salt. I'll give you a great example as to why here in just a minute. For now, though, I think it's safe to say that Reuben Houston Burrow is a four-wheel train robber. Oh, and check this out. Nobody knew it was him. He was not a wanted man, at least not by name. He and his gang were completely off the radar as far as law enforcement went. They could have called it quits at this point, enjoyed their money, and assuming they all kept their damn mouths shut, would have never been caught. As it was, Rube was now making more money in just a few minutes than he could make in an entire year farming or watching cow shit, so that's hard to pass up, and he just kept on robbing. I'll give him credit, though. He would change up his area of operations. No more robbing the same train at the same damn spot. The next holdup would happen in Genoa, Arkansas, on December 9th, 1887. And this would be their biggest haul thus far, netting the gang $3,500 directly from the company safe. It was Rube, his brother Jim, and the William Brock I mentioned a minute ago. Brock, by the way, had uh, been an employee of Rube's back in Texas. The men waited until the train had just began to pull out of Genoa, some 20 miles east of Texarkana when they ordered the conductor to keep the train going, but to stop at a particular location about a mile and a half further down the line. Rube followed these instructions with a statement that he didn't want to hurt anybody, but that he was going to either, quote, rob this train or kill every man on it, end quote. Once arrived at the spot, the train was halted, and Rube called out to his, quote, unquote, boys in the brush, which is really just one man who I assume was Brock. The trio then firing shot after shot from their rifles in the general direction of the passenger cars, I'm assuming, to dissuade anybody from playing Hero, eventually gained access and made off with about $2,000. Or $3,500. Or $10,000. I think the biggest estimate I read was $50,000. Remember what I said a minute ago about a grain of salt, right? I think it's always better to err on the side of caution when it comes to these figures, and I tend to believe the low end. But still, let's say it was about $3,500. bucks. That's a little over 100000 in today's money. Not bad for a few hours worth of work, right? But the boys weren't out of the woods just yet. For some reason, they were on foot. And that night, a posse alerted to the holdup, was formed in Texarkana, and rode quickly towards the scene of the crime. 
Not too far outside of Texarkana. However, a little bit past midnight, they came upon three men walking near the tracks. These strangers, which were actually the Burrow brothers and Brock, were ordered to halt and one of them made a run for it. The posse started firing their guns and so did they and they had them a little shootout but to no avail. Nobody on either side was injured and Rube and the boys made their getaway in the cover of dark. The next morning though, when inspecting the area where the three mysterious men were returning fire from, a hat and some new coats were found, each one bearing the mark KWP. The hat, now in possession of the Pinkertons, was tracked to Dublin, Texas where it was sold but the detectives were not able to get a positive ID on the buyer. They had more luck with the coats, though. They went from store to store, and finally, in Alexander, Texas, they found the exact place where the Colts were sold, and the shopkeep even identified the man who bought them as being William Brock, and the other guy that was with them, whose name he couldn't recall, who was from Alabama. Bingo! This is all the Pinkertons needed right there. On December 31st, early in the morning, before the sun was even up, William Brock was arrested at his father's home. He was then taken to Texarkana, where the train conductor identified him, and upon further questioning, Brock admitted to everything, even named his accomplices, Rube and his brother Jim. This meant that the law now, for the very first time, were aware of the Burrow brothers. They also knew where they were staying at now, back there in Alabama, Vernon, Alabama, to be exact, in Lamar County, right there on the border of Mississippi. And man, what a name for a town, Vernon. As of the 2020 census, Vernon only had about 2,000 people living there, and without knowing much else, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that it is a country-ass town. Vernon. I don't know if you've ever known anybody named Vernon, but I have. You're not going to meet many 19-year-olds named Vernon, alright? Your typical Vernon is a kindly older gentleman, usually retired, a little overweight, wearing overalls. Vernons will typically know where the best barbecue joint is nearby. They're nice to little kids. They go deer hunting in sweatpants and old t-shirts and they don't wear camo and have never sprayed deer urine on their boots in their entire lives, but they tag out every year. And then they skin their deer with a tiny little case pocket knife. And that's what I like to think of, at least when I hear the name Vernon. And although I don't know anybody from Alabama, I feel like there's some people there in Vernon, Alabama, that probably fit that bill. Now, when the law showed up in Vernon to arrest Rube, there was a big mix-up. The Pinkertons, along with the local sheriff, hit the wrong house. Not once, but twice. By the time they located the correct house, only Jim Burrow was home. Rube, turns out, was about 18 miles away in the town of Kennedy. Jim made a run for it and quickly got word to his brother, and they both made their way to Montgomery, Alabama, via train. The law was already waiting on them there as well, though. By this point, not only were their names distributed everywhere, but so was a picture likeness. The boys were made by the conductor before they even reached their destination. And once there, he tipped off the local authorities who decided to try a little bit of a ruse. They posed as railroad men and offered to take their brothers to a boarding house for the night. Boarding house, of course, turned out to be the jailhouse. When the chief of police finally broke the news and told Rube that he was going to be under arrest, he replied with a good southern, I reckon not, and a fight broke out. A fight that got a little hectic. Finally, Rube was able to get away after putting a round in the lung of a newspaperman who was foolish enough to volunteer to help the law. But his brother Jim was taken into custody, where he initially said his name was Jim Hankins. But you know, he eventually confessed to his true identity. He told a police captain that if he and his brother were given revolvers, that they, quote, are not afraid of any two men living, end quote. This was in January of 1888, and although still free, Rube Burrow was a marked man. There would be no more slipping into Texas or back home to Sweet Home, Alabama to enjoy his spoils and anonymity as he was used to. There was a big manhunt the following day following his escape, and they actually tracked Rube to a cabin outside of town. But being the slippery eel he was, he once again avoided being captured, but barely. He did get peppered uh, with birdshot as he made his escape. Barefoot, slightly wounded, alone, and hungry, Rube Burrow fled deep into the Alabama swamp that night before coming upon yet another cabin. This one occupied. Didn't stop Rube from entering, though, unbeknownst to the African Americans that were sleeping soundly inside. He rested in front of the fire and warmed himself before making his getaway with a pair of borrowed shoes and a quilt. A few miles further down the road, he quietly stole a horse, which he rode hard till daylight before turning the animal loose and going even further, deeper, into the Alabama backwoods on foot. This is going to be something that Rube would end up doing a lot. Guy must have been one hell of an outdoorsman, and evidently he didn't mind camping. After a few months of laying low, Burrow partnered up with another old ranching buddy from Texas, a Leonard Brock, who I believe 
was the brother to the previous William Brock I just mentioned, the one who told on Rube and Jim. If I'm wrong on this, please don't hesitate to correct me. Josh at WildWestExtra.com And this next little bit is interesting as Rube convinced Leonard to start going by the name of Joe Jackson instead of his real name. I guess there was another Joe Jackson who was a famous train robber, but I couldn't find much information on the man. Like, matter of fact, I'm not even sure if he even existed. According to a scant few sources, it looks like a Joe Jackson was a member of the Sam Bass gang and the only one to elude authorities after Bass met his maker. I found another source claiming that Jackson had rode with Quantrill in the raid against Lawrence, Kansas, and that he was generally just a very scary dude. Don't know how true any of that is. Uh, I guess the idea, though, was to make the law and the public at large think that these two dangerous men, Rube and Joe, had partnered up to make some sort of a superhero outlaw duo. Also, if you read any stories on Rube Burrow, you'll see not only William and Leonard Brock mentioned, but Joe Jackson as well as Lewis Waldrop. William Brock was the original member of the gang who got caught and snitched on Rube. Lewis Waldrop, Joe Jackson, and Leonard Brock, however, all seem to be the same person, just different aliases. Woo! Okay, there you go. One thing's for sure, though. Rube wanted to see his brother free from that damn Texarkana jail. Only thing was, it weren't going to be easy. Especially with him and Brock constantly having to be on the move. Alabama to Mississippi, then back to Alabama, camping out in the woods or old abandoned logging camps. Dodging Pinkertons and bounty hunters and local sheriffs behind every damn tree. Man, the life of an outlaw. You got all that money, but you can't even enjoy it. You're essentially living like a damn vagabond sleeping on the ground. And unfortunately, uh, despite the quoted desire to free his brother, even if it meant dying in the process, Rube was unable to do so. By September of 88, Jim fell ill and just a month later would finally pass away. A death likely caused by tuberculosis. But I suppose life goes on, right? Rube, now with his brother in the grave, planned his next robbery. But not before rolling up his sleeves and doing a little bit of honest work. Believe it or not, Burrow and Brock hired themselves out as day labor, picking cotton for 50 cent per hundred, for about two months. And evidently, Burrow was pretty good at it. Now, obviously, they were going under assumed names, and this place was so far out of the way that they didn't really draw much suspicion. Once things quieted down or the cotton was all picked, the pair moved on to their next score. It would occur in mid-December 1888 when Rube and Leonard took down another train near Duck Hill, Mississippi, right over there by Beaver Pond down the road from Possum Holler. Just swing a left to Squirrel Creek. You can't miss it. And yeah, okay, I did just make those last three up, but uh, Duck Hill is a very real place. And so was the train that Rube robbed there. This holdup would go off the rails, though, pun intended. A passenger attempted to intervene, and he got shot and killed for his efforts. The young man's name was Chester Hughes, and he was traveling with his widowed sister and her young children. While Rube and Brock were robbing the express car, the conductor got it into his mind to play John Wayne. He skedaddled to one of the passenger coaches and asked for volunteers to help him. That's when Chester stood up. He and the conductor then borrowed rifles from two other men, Winchesters, and they set off to save the day. Unfortunately, they came face-to-face with one of the robbers, and Chester Hughes took three rounds within a six-inch spread through the stomach. The brave young man would be dead within minutes. And I'm not really sure who fired the shots that killed him, Uh, but I don't guess it matters, you know? You and a buddy go into a 7-Eleven to rob it, and your buddy shoots and kills the cashier, guess what? Your ass is getting charged with murder, too. Now, Rube actually caught a lucky break on this one. The Pinkertons were convinced it was a different bandit by the name of Eugene Bunch. He not only fit Rube's physical description, but he had a helper who fit that of Brock's. The detective agency actually tracked Bunch all the way to San Francisco, where he finally eluded them at the last second by catching an ocean liner and sailing off into the Pacific. And I really hope that part is true. I don't really know much about Eugene Bunch, but you better believe I added his name to the list of future Wild West extravaganza topics. Now, with a fresh train scalp on their belts, Rube and Brock returned to Lamar County, Alabama, where they remained in quote-unquote quiet seclusion. And I think Burrow chose Lamar County because, well, it was his home turf. He knew the woods, he knew all the hiding places, and most importantly, he knew the people. They were his people. Family and extended family and friends. And they were all able to keep a watchful eye out for the law and anybody else who might come poking around. And things really were quiet for a few months. You know, Reuben laid low and continued to garner the admiration of the locals. Rube never robbed a poor man was the slogan passed among the populace. And it weren't just Lamar County either. Neighboring Fayette and Marion counties also abounded with Rube supporters. 
A code of signals was established that ranged from simply firing off a gun to blowing a horn to even cracking a whip. Anything that would send the stranger danger alert. Food rations and other supplies were left out for burrow and rock crevices and other areas where he knew to look. By all accounts, it seems that the people there really liked Rube and they took real good care of him. At least they did until he finally messed up big time. That next summer, Burrow decided a disguise might suit his purposes a little better. So he got a catalog and ordered himself a wig and a fake mustache. I guess with the thought that he could travel freely if he wore them or at least not be recognized so easily during his next robbery. And God only knows how ridiculous a fake mustache and wig looked back in 1889. In my mind, I'm picturing a pair of those uh, Groucho Marx glasses with a fake nose and mustache, along with some ridiculous, horribly colored wig. And it should go without saying that Rube didn't order this disguise under his real name. No, only an idiot would do that. He sent for it under the alias of WW Fake Wig and Stash, the third, Esquire. No, he didn't do that. I wish he did, but he didn't. No, WW Kane was the name he used. Pretty cool alias. And he ordered it to be delivered at the nearby Sullivan, Alabama post office. Only problem was the word Sullivan was either misread or hard to read, and he got sent to Jewel, Alabama instead. And the postmaster over in Jewel was a real pain in the ass. Now, Jewel, from what I can tell, no longer exists. According to one source, it was about six miles away from wherever Rube was staying, which I assume was Vernon. Now, I was kind of joking about that postmaster over there in uh, Jewel being a real pain in the ass. But he was a real pain in Rube's ass. The guy's name was Moses Graves. And the two actually knew each other. In fact, they were schoolmates growing up. But I get the feeling there was no great love between the men. Especially with what happens next. The package not only arrived at the wrong post office, but it arrived torn. Its contents exposed. This caused quite the stir in rural Jewel, Alabama, as it was obvious the package contained a disguise. And I'm guessing it didn't take no genius to figure out who the disguise was meant for. Postmaster Graves soon let it be known that he would call for the arrest of whoever, wink wink, tried to claim the parcel and kept mouthing off that he wanted to know what the hell business anybody had in ordering such a get up. Well, Rube heard about all this mouthing off and he came calling, in person, to deal with his great and damn mailman. He waited until just after sundown and crept silently into the post office, coming face to face with Mr. Graves. Have you any mail for W.W. Kane? Burrow asked, staring daggers into the no longer tough-talking civilian before him. Graves, though, to his credit, answered, Yes, but I cannot deliver it to you. Wrong fucking answer. Without hesitation, Rube pulled his revolver out and shot Moses Graves in the stomach, saying, quote, I'll teach you to open my mail, end quote. He then leveled the six-shooter at Graves' assistant, a young woman, telling her to retrieve his package or that he'd, quote, blow her head off. Rube loved threatening to blow people's heads off. He was actually quoted as saying that to several different people. And to be fair, it is a threat that often worked. Needless to say, he left with his package in tow. Not that it would be of much help, and there is no indication that he actually ever used the wig. I get the feeling that he probably threw it away in disgust after seeing how silly it looked. Disguise or no disguise, though, he messed up. He was already towing the line, as it were. Sure, the locals liked him, and many were willing to help him out. But he was still an outlaw, a criminal. You do your dirty stuff away from us, just don't bring it back around here to our back door. But here he was, shitting where he eats. And the biggest issue, obviously, was the cold-blooded murder of a respected citizen. People may have liked Rube, but they also loved Moses Graves. And Rube didn't exactly kill the man out of self-defense or self-preservation. He dropped that hammer out of pure meanness and probably a whole hell of a lot of irritation. As you can imagine, this did cause Rubin to lose a lot of local support. And the law, if they were holding back at all, no longer did so. They knew who was helping him, and they came down hard. Homes were raided. Simple farmers, family men were arrested, all for the crime of aiding and abetting Reuben Burrow. Hell, even Rube's own father got arrested. Things got so heated there in Vernon that the governor of Alabama called in the military to keep the peace. And I didn't even know that Alabama had a governor. With all this pressure, you can probably imagine how hot things were getting for Rube. After this murder, he went and found him a hole. Never again sleeping under a roof there in Lamar County or taking a meal at a friendly table. It's too risky. Pinkertons were there. The Southern Express Railroad had their own detectives digging around. You had the local law and you had bounty hunters. Matter of fact, at one point, the manhunt for Reuben Burrow was one of the biggest ever conducted in the United States thus far. So Rube left for safer pastures. He, Leonard, and another Rube, Rube Smith. 
trio headed southwest into Mississippi, where they held up a train near Buckatuna in Wayne County. Buckatuna. Gotta love these southern town names. Now, this would have been in late September of 89, and the gang got away with a few thousand dollars, several hundred of which were ironically stolen out of the registered mail. Guess old Rube wasn't all that passionate about tampering with the mail after all. The bandits, foolishly in my opinion, returned to Lamar County, but once again they saw the pressure of law enforcement got to be too much, so they didn't stay long. Move it again in November. Burrow and Brockwood, at least. Uh, Rube Smith had been arrested already after an ill-advised trip to Indian Territory. And that's a whole different story in itself. I'll let you dig into that if you're interested. When Rube and Leonard left Lamar County, they did not do so on horseback. Oh, no. They did so in an ox cart. They were headed towards sunny Florida, and I guess they figured that by riding in the ox cart and driving oxen, they'd look like common laborers. And it worked, at least for a little bit. They were able to slip past law enforcement, but the detectives soon got wind and put out a Wild West APB for two shady individuals and a couple of oxen. February of 1890 would find Rube Burrow once again doing honest work, this time alone, and going by the name of Ward. He was just south of Milton, Florida, putting that ox cart of his to good use, hauling supplies back and forth from lumber camps to Broxton's Ferry. I guess he and Brock had split up with the plans to reunite a little while later, uh, but once again, the law was ever on Rube's tail, always just a few steps behind him, and they did finally catch up with him down there at Broxton's Ferry in Florida. And he did once again evade rest by doing what he had always done, taking off on foot straight into the damn forest. Now this is up in, uh, what do you call it, the, the panhandle of Florida? Just due south of the Alabama border. If you look on a map, the area the Rube escaped to, even now, is kind of wild. Known as the Blackwater River State Forest. So we ain't exactly talking about Miami here. There were no hot Cuban girls dancing around. It was just Rube out in the middle of nowhere, thick timber and swampland. And he effectively disappeared. Meanwhile, Mr. Brock went and got himself arrested. He showed up at the predetermined meeting place where he and Rube were supposed to be reunited, only to find no Rube. He then heard about the close call down in Florida, so he deemed it unsafe and split. Went back to Lamar County for a bit, big mistake as he was under constant surveillance, and then, in an attempt to travel to Louisiana to meet with family, was arrested without incident and taken to Memphis and placed in jail. More on him towards the end, uh, you can actually read his full confession online, which I'll link to, really interesting stuff in there. As for Rube, he was busy playing Swamp Rat, deep in those cane breaks of Santa Rosa County, Florida. And I'm talking he was hiding out for months before he finally reemerged in September of 1890 to take down one last train all on his own. It was the Northbound Express the Rube held up in Flomaton or Flomaton, Alabama. A daring feat indeed that only garnered him a measly sum of $256 and a whole lot of heat from the railroad detectives. By this point, not even the swamps of Florida were safe. The law quickly tracked Rube and even found the cabin that he'd been staying in, so he had no choice but to flee yet again on foot. Sticking to the backwoods, he quickly and stealthily worked his way north of Florida towards the Florida-Georgia line until he heard the song This Is How We Roll by the band Florida-Georgia Line. Pulling his revolver, thumbing back the hammer, and pressing the barrel to his temple, Rube is reported to have said, quote, Holy shit, if this is what passes as country music in these parts, then I might as well end it all myself, end quote. Thankfully, he then heard a song by Benjamin Todd and a couple of Chris Knight songs and just kind of quickly brought him back to his senses. It was a close call, though. I mean, I think we should all be honest here. What's the worst crime? Robbing a couple of trains or allowing the Florida Georgia line on the public airwaves? You tell me. OK, so maybe I told a little bit of a fib there. Uh, in all actuality, Rube headed north out of Florida, but he was working his way back into Alabama, eventually making it all the way to Marengo County near the town of Demopolis. Word had gotten out, though, and the locals were already alerted of his presence. One of which, a black dude named Jesse Hildreth, actually discovered Rube sleeping out the rain in an abandoned cabin. He woke the outlaw up and immediately recognized who he was and started to attempt to delay or distract Rube long enough to somehow get the drop on him. Initially, Mr. Hildreth tried to sell Burrow his horse, but when Rube said he wasn't in the market for a horse and was insistent on making his way on foot, Jesse offered to guide him. A few hours later, the two came upon the cabin of another black man, one of Jesse's friends, George Ford. Hildreth convinced Rube that since it was about to rain again, they might as well stop at Ford's place and have some dinner and maybe a little bit of a siesta. Rube agreed, and while everyone was eating, Jesse left the cabin, not sure why Rube allowed this, and was met outside by another guy named Frank Marshall. 
Jesse told Frank who he had inside, and Frank shared that there were two white men nearby, one a detective and the other a plantation owner, and that he'd go fetch them. Jesse then went back into the cabin to find Rube, totally unaware and just finishing his dinner. He was actually in the process of wrapping his trusted rifle up with a bit of oil cloth. More on that rifle in a little bit. Jesse saw this as an opening. Boss, let me wrap it for you, he said, motioning to the firearm. Rube amazingly hands it over. Jesse does like he says, wraps it up, and then, pretending to hand it back to Rube, he drops it. In a flash, both Jesse and Frank pounce on Rube, attempting to ride him to the ground. But Burrow's fighting like a damn caged animal. He sinks his teeth into Frank's shoulder as he drags both men across the floor of the cabin, so much so that the whole damn structure is shaking. Made such a racket that the two white dudes could hear the scuffle from outside. They run in, now it's four on one, no time flat, they were able to finally subdue and disarm Rube Burrow. He was soon searched and trussed and taken to the county seat of Linden, about nine miles away. And this was October 7th, 1890. The great train robber Reuben Burrow was finally arrested, but he wouldn't stay that way for long. Early the next morning, Rube started complaining about being hungry and talked a couple of jailers into handing him his bag, which he claimed contained some ginger snaps. Now, I'm not sure how true that is, but I do know what the bag definitely had in it. A revolver, which Rube immediately yanked out. I will never get over how naive some of these old West jailers were. You hear and read stories like this all the time. Now, when Rube was arrested back there at that cabin, he had a pistol on him, 45 Colt, as well as his trusty lever action rifle. These were taken, but nobody thought to search his bag of mysterious contents. These must have been the two dudes that were guarding Epstein. Rube, who, by the way, was shackled to the floor, ordered the three men at gunpoint to let him out. He then shackled two of them to the floor while he took the third man, Jesse Hildreth, you know, that black dude who initially discovered him, as a hostage. And Rube was about to make good his getaway, and he probably would have got by with it, but he decided he wanted his rifle back. He loved that damn rifle. And he also wanted the money that they took off him the previous day before, around $175, both of which were in the possession of a local merchant named Davis Carter. I guess Mr. Carter had previously been helping to guard Rube, but had retired to his place of business before uh, Burrow escaped. Now, there's a few versions of what happens next. I've read that Rube got his possessions back. I've also read that he was confronted on his way to get his possessions. And I've read this version, which I'll now share with you. Don't worry, they all end the same way. Burrow, 45 Colton in hand, and Jesse Hildreth in tow, made his way to where Carter was, just across the street from the jail. As soon as Carter appeared at the door, Rube pointed his pistol at the man and said, quote, Give me my rifle and my money or I'll, say it with me, class, blow your head off. Dude was not in the mood for games at this point, but I reckon neither was Carter. He coolly replied, all right, while at the same time slipping a hand deftly into a pocket and coming up with his own gun, a little thirty two caliber Smith & Wesson. Both men began firing almost damn near point blank, and Rube's bullet punched through Carter's left shoulder just above the collarbone. Davis's pistol barked, but he missed. Both men were now on the move, both firing wildly with Rube retreating, firing as he went, and Carter boldly advancing. It looks like both men fired five rounds each. The only one of Rube's to hit the mark was the first one, and the only one of Carter's to hit pay dirt was his fourth, and it was all that was needed. According to one eyewitness, it entered Rube. It says he turned to run and caused him to jump into the air, and then he fell down dead to the ground the bullet having entered his upper abdomen and cutting his portal artery, whatever that is. And like I said, Carter fired once more a fifth shot, likely as Rube was falling, but it was a miss. It was that fourth shot that did the trick. And Mr. Hildreth, to his credit, had somehow gotten his hands on a gun through all this action, and he started shooting as well, but none of his rounds hit anything either. Nevertheless, it was dawn, October 8th, 1890, and Reuben Houston Burrow was dead. Rube's body was then put on display, as many bodies of dead outlaws were back in those days. Just do a Google image search and you'll see the photo. It's him propped up in a coffin, bearded face, arms crossed, his hat sitting on his hands, cartridge belt with both pistols holstered, hanging there from his hands also, and that prized rifle of his propped up between his legs. It was an 1888 Marlin lever action, chambered in 3840, caliber that I'm ashamed to admit that I had never heard of before. I could be wrong here, but I believe this would be somewhat similar to a 4440. Now, the make and model of that rifle comes to me from listener Joe Wheeler, who has a very interesting connection with Rube Burrow. Joe grew up on land belonging to Rube, land purchased by Joe's great-great-grandmother from Burrow himself. 
land that Joe's family still owns, I believe. He wrote and said that he was a kid in the 1980s when there were still big old trees on the property where Rube would hide out looking for the law. And these trees still had carvings on them done by Rube. He also tells me that there were rumors of money hidden there on the land and that as a kid, he would always go exploring in caves hoping to find some of it. But no luck. How cool is that though, man? I would have given anything to have had caves to play in when I was a little kid. And all the more cooler if those caves could have possibly been holding hidden treasure from an outlaw. Joe also shared with me a blog post he made, which I will link to in the show notes, with lots of cool pictures, including the rifle, which is now on display in Montgomery, Alabama. They also have that sixth round from Rube's revolver that he never got to shoot on display as well. Also included in the blog post is a picture of the old Marengo County Courthouse where the last gunfight took place right in front of. The building's still standing. Such a cool connection to have to a real-life outlaw. I said it on my last episode, and I'll say it again. We're all history dorks here. Outlaw or not, good guy or bad guy, we're all going to nerd out over some stuff like this. So thank you, Joe, for the info. I hope I didn't let you down too much with this episode. Uh, Honestly, you probably know way more than I ever will about Rube Burrow. So I hope I didn't stray too far off the path. Anything I got wrong, please, man, let me know, and I will write the record on the next episode. Unfortunately, Rube's ordeal wasn't quite over yet. Like I was saying, his body was put on display. Finally, when they shipped it back to his poor parents, his mother and father were waiting at the train station. When the train comes in, the coffin was just unceremoniously just tossed off onto the ground right in front of his parents and it broke into a bunch of pieces, spilling the dead outlaw out. Now that in and of itself would have probably been pretty traumatizing for Rube's mother and father, but it was made even more so by the fact that it was very apparent that Rube's body had been mutilated after his death. Rube's father simply collected his son and returned him to Vernon, burying him in the Fellowship Cemetery. And there he rests to this day. His dad would join him there nine years later, and his mom, dying in 1912, is also buried there. And I guess that's that. I always had to think about the mothers, man. The stress of knowing that your child has gone wrong. Not being able to do anything about it. Right or wrong, your mom's always going to love you. Now, before we finish, I'd like to speculate a bit on Rube and maybe toss in my own worthless opinion. He's clearly still a folk hero to many in Alabama. I get that. The Robin Hood Alabama, right? only targeting supposedly the rich. And Rube had humble beginnings. He wasn't forced into the outlaw life by war and doesn't appear that he had all that much of a wild streak as a young man, at least not more than anybody else. He was a hard worker, even as a wanted man. He would often work his ass off, picking cotton or hauling freight. So was he a good man or was he a bad man? And does it even matter? And what pushed him into that life? Was it really his wife dying and that farm going under? Was he struggling to make ends meet, just hoping to scrap together enough money? to send to his children? Or was it the easy money he was drawn to? I don't know. I do know one thing, though. It sucks being broke. Especially when you're doing what you're supposed to do. You know, maybe you didn't go to college or you weren't born into money, but that doesn't mean that you're lazy. But you work your fingers to the bone. Hard work. You're outside or in some sweaty-ass machine shop or on some oil rig. That first drop of sweat drips down your ass crack at 6, 7 a.m. And you don't stop sweating until you get home which is 12, 14 hours later. Five days, six days, seven days a week, just trying to make ends meet. And it's still not enough. You get your paycheck, and after child support taxes and all that, you're not left with much. And you got to figure out which bills not to pay that week. You know, maybe you can call the electric company and get an extension. But still, you got to put gas in your truck, and you got to eat, right? So you go to the grocery store, and you think to yourself, how can I make this $40 last the rest of the week? I'll tell you how. Cans of tuna fish and tuna helper, the generic tuna helper, right? And you get some of that cheap white bread and some cheap bologna and the mustard that just says mustard. A few gallons of wine and some cigarettes so at least you can feel alive for a few hours when you're not at work being miserable. Rinse and repeat. Maybe you go to the pawn shop if you've got anything else left to pawn. God forbid you go to the payday loan place. Those fucking vultures talk about criminals. Work, 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 no money. It's an endless cycle. Every penny just slipping through your fingers. There's always something, right? You screw away a few bucks and your AC goes out. Or maybe you got to replace your transmission. New brakes. School clothes for your kids. Christmas. Birthdays. Vacations. Vacation? What the fuck is a vacation? That's something those white people on TV do. Not you. So you go back to the grocery store and you stare down at your shopping cart. And you see your dirty fingers and the mustard and the cans of off-brand tuna. And then you look around. And you see the Gentiles, the clean ones, the soft souls who have to go to the gym to sweat. 
They've got full carts, steaks, and weird shit you never even heard of, like almond milk and hummus. They work their little 40-hour jobs, making two, dollars $300,000 a year, weekends off, vacation, cruises, country clubs. And on the inside, you're seeing all this, you're just screaming, what the fuck? And I tell you, man, I'm not excusing anything. And while I realize we can't put our modern way of thinking onto these historical figures, and I'm fully aware that they were just a different type of human back in those days, still doesn't change the fact that whether you're talking about the Old West or ancient Rome, it sucks being broke. And sometimes it's enough to make a man pick up a gun and take things that don't belong to him. Rube Burrow spent the better part of 30 years just trying to do everything the right way. He worked his daddy's farm, his uncle's ranch, then his own spread. He got married, raised a family. But then the fever came and destroyed those dreams. So he started over, put on a strong face and kept tolling away. And then the crops failed. Another dream and another wife lost. Some sources suggest that Rube was partly inspired by Sam Bass and his gang. And okay, maybe. But Sam Bass had been dead for eight years before Rube turned to a life of crime. I'm thinking maybe he just had enough. It's hard when you're doing everything right, when you're working that hard, and so many other people have so much more than you. Like in Rube's case, the railroad men. And they had it in excess. Now, I got to looking at Lamar County, Alabama, where Rube called home. It's not a very big county, only home to about 14,000 souls. And that's less people than what lived there at the time of Rube's death, by the way. Now, you want to take a guess? At the median income per household in Lamar County, $33,887 per household per year, $42,000 per family. Can you please explain to me how the hell a family can be raised on that type of income? Meanwhile, you got these multi billion dollar corporations that don't even pay taxes. You know, Jeff Bezos flew himself into outer space with his money while his own employees shit in the back of Amazon vans. And Elon Musk is spending billions to buy Twitter just to own the libs. And what are you doing? Buying fucking tuna fish at Piggly Wiggly's. Look, I'm no socialist or communist. I'm all for the free market and I'm all for capitalism. Go out there and get yours. But damn, man, all I'm saying is things should be a little easier for the working man. There's no reason people need to be out here working that damn hard and still be that damn broke. Obviously, this doesn't excuse taking what's not yours. I get that. I'm not advocating the lifestyle that Rube chose. And he did choose it. Nobody forced him to rob any trains. And if you think about it, what good came out of it? The money he stole off them rich robber barons who owned the railroads was just a drop in the bucket. Don't get it twisted. They kept on smoking their fancy cigars and sipping champagne with their little pinky sticking out. And the poor people who helped Rube, who hit him, who snuck him food, they didn't get rich. All those poor farmers who lived there in Lamar County, they still had their work to do. They still got up every morning before the rooster and worked every day in the fields, probably hoping like hell that their own children didn't get caught up in Rube Burroughs' escapades. Nothing ever became of any of it. Rube simply had some excitement, and some innocent people got killed, and then he himself left the world early, two months shy of his 35th birthday. His kids without a father and his own parents likely haunted for the rest of their lives. I don't know what the moral of the story is. Uh, marry you a girl with a rich dad, I guess, or win the lottery. But if you pick up that gun and start taking shit that's not yours, it probably isn't going to end well. Not for you or anybody that cares about you. And just to nail this point at home, remember Joe Jackson, real name Leonard Brock? Remember how I said he got arrested shortly before Rube robbed that train all by himself? Well, he confessed, pled guilty, and received a life sentence. But it wouldn't be a long life. On November 10th, 1890, a day after Rube was killed, Brock committed suicide by jumping off the roof of the prison. On his body was a note with the following written, quote, How wise we are when the chance is gone, and a glance we backward cast. We know just the thing we should have done when the time for doing is past. End quote. On a lighter note, remember Jefferson Davis Carter, the man who killed Rube Burrow? Well, Mr. Davis would live another 30 years, dying in 1920 at the age of 60. His wife, Lenora, however, would live all the way to the year 1963, passing away at 90 years of age. So that means that if you're over the age of 60, listening right now, then you were alive at the same time as the wife of a dude that shot down a famous Old West outlaw. Just yet another reminder that this stuff was not that long ago. And that's about all I've got on Rube Burrow. Thank you once again to Joe Wheeler. Love that little bit of insider information. And thank you if you actually listened to all 92 minutes of my last episode, Brushy Bill is a lying liar. Speaking of that episode, I just want to clarify one thing as far as Pat Garrett goes. If I were to place money on it right now, I'd say that Pat more than likely killed Billy the Kid. 
I just don't think he did it the way he said. You know, just sitting there in the dark and then Billy walks on in with a knife. I'm thinking maybe Pat was just tired of the kid always slipping away and he simply shot him on sight with no weapon, possibly from behind. But yeah, that was a fun episode and one I'd been wanting to do for a while. Also, big shout out to those of you who keyed me in on the audio issues with YouTube. I still don't know what the hell happened and I'm hoping I don't have the same issues with this episode. Kind of ironic, though, that on the very same episode that I warned you to subscribe elsewhere because, as you now see, this whole YouTube thing could simply vanish at any moment and then we have problems. So if you haven't already, please go on over to my website, wildwestextra.com, and there's a tab there that says listen. That tab will bring you to a ton of links to the various other places you can listen and download and consume the Wild West extravaganza. Please subscribe to any of them. It's 100% free and ad-free. For now, at least. If you got a smartphone, I promise that there's already an app on your phone that will allow you to download and listen to this podcast wherever and whenever you please. Also, while you're there, hit that contact button and send me an email. Let me know your thoughts on Rube Burrow. And let me know if you got any future episode topic suggestions. Big shout out to the Bowl After Bowl podcast, those little potheads who gave me some banner love recently. I guess they were at a big event and they had this banner flying that included the logo of the Wild West Extravaganza. So that was pretty cool to see. And finally, huge shout out to somebody y'all have never heard me mention before. A guy named Mason Amadeus, one of the creative geniuses behind the podcast known as PodCube. I'm not going to go into too much detail here sharing how the sausage is made. But Mason recently was a huge help to me as far as his podcast goes. And whether he likes it or not, he has made a friend for life. Seriously. The help Mason provided me for free likely would have cost me hundreds, if not more, if I went to some consultant or one of these so-called gurus. And you'd be doing me and yourself a big favor if you took the time out to check out his podcast. He did not ask for this, by the way. This is not a paid advertisement. And no, the podcast has absolutely nothing to do with the Old West or even history. But it is great. And I'm not just saying that because the guy helped me out. I'm genuinely a fan. If you like sketch comedy or absurd comedy, you will love PodCube can't really explain it much more than that, but I will play their trailer, and here it goes. PodCube. Our PodCube devices are able to record audio from any time or place, in space or time or place. And this is what they're picking up. I hate flowers. flowers. I feel like a poop seller. I feel like I'm selling poop. There's a whole baby Mark Zuckerberg in here. Is it real? I, I don't think so, but it's wet and it doesn't smell good. Did you smell the mouth? No, I didn't smell. Hi, welcome to Circuit City. Can I help you find anything now, today? Now, politely, just shut up. I'm going to take this iPod, dip it in some sauce. Ooh, hard to eat. Bet you it'd be harder to eat without all the sauce on it. Search PodCube in your podcast app or go to poweredbypodcube.com. PodCube, the future is yesterday. All right. And that was PodCube. Hopefully you smiled or possibly chortled. The episodes are pretty short. They're usually less than 10 minutes long, so give them a listen. Link in the show notes. Their most recent episode, IT Help Desk, had me cracking up. Big thank you to my supporters over there at Patreon. Andrew, my man David Allen, Lester, Cameron, Brandon, Bill, Ryan, Asher, Reggae, Eric, Timothy, Velverde, Creature, Skinny Dick, Keith, Tony, Man of Enchantment, Michael, Jamie, Alphonse, Everett, Momo, and Mark from Down Under. And as always, a huge thank you to those of you supporting me via Buy Me A Coffee. Most recently, John, Rusty, and Zero Growth. Thank you! Your donations most definitely help keep things running here at Bloody Beaver Productions. If you too would like to contribute to the cause, please feel free to hit me up at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Wild West. And don't forget to share this episode if you like it, and hit up my website, wildwestextra.com, for more true tales from the wild and woolly west. While you're there, hit that contact button. Till next time, thank you so much, and try not to kill your mailman. Adios. Adios.